So for a long time, I've looked up to and listened to these old things called cassettes that many of you don't know what they are. Um, spent a lot of money on those cassettes that I can't use anymore, uh, but listened to Dr. Jack Deere and have been discipled uh, by listening to his teaching. And we are going to be so blessed this morning because him and his wife, Lisa, are here with us this morning, and he's going to be sharing from the Word of God. So let's give Dr. Jack Deere a good South, South Louisiana welcome. Come on. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay. If you're, uh, this is your very first time to be here this morning, um, and you come to Antioch, this church that's meeting in an uh, auditorium and it's filled with tons of young people, I just want you to know it's not a cult. Okay? <laughs> but the mothership will be here at noon to take us back to Waco, Texas, if we want to go. <laughs> Actually, uh, I regard it as a great honor uh, to stand on any Antioch stage in our country. It's one of the all-time great churches. It's one of the churches that leads more people to Christ and disciples more people than any church I know. So it's my honor to be here this morning. I'm grateful to be here. I want to tell you a little bit about my uh, story. Um, I was not raised in a Christian home. I was raised in a traumatic home. My dad and mom were at war from the time I was about five or six years old, and I didn't understand that war at all. My dad became an absentee dad, and that, in, that fueled mom's rage, and she took a rage out on us. She called them spankings, but they were really beatings. But when you're a kid growing up in a sick home, you don't know the difference between a spanking and a beating because sick homes uh, have secrets that never, ever get out, and we lived in one of those homes. When I was 12 years old, I was the oldest of four kids. I had two younger brothers, a baby sister. When I was uh, 12 years old, my father ended the war with my mom by committing suicide. And he left a 34-year-old uh, woman, a very pretty 34-year-old woman, with a 10th grade education to care for his four kids. Now, in 1961 in Texas, there's no way a woman with a 10th grade education is going to be able to provide for four kids. So my brothers and, and sister, we, we, we saw, we had this parade of men come through our home and we saw these things that kids should never ever see in their uh, home. Mom became an alcoholic and then after a while she became a morning drinker. And all of us kids, we just, we had zero supervision from the time I was 13, I mean, I came and went as I, I pleased. If I didn't want to come home, I didn't come home. Uh, we always had a bar in our home, and so I could mix drinks at the bar, and mom's boyfriends thought it was really cool that this 14-year-old could mix whiskey sours, mix their drink, and then knock back whiskey sours and, and laughed about it. Um, we had no money. We almost lost our home twice uh, because mom couldn't pay the taxes. Um, I had no money for clothes, and, and so I figured out ways to steal my clothes. I had... Uh, I had no, uh, just no qualms about right or wrong. Um, the worst thing my dad did was not kill himself. The worst thing my dad did was turn me against God while he was still alive. And he did that when I was nine years old. Um, he had told me there was a God, that God was omniscient, omnipresent, and told me about Adam and Eve. But one day when I was nine years old, I asked him how you get into heaven. And here's what he told me. When you die, you go up and you stand before the gates of heaven. St. Peter comes out with a book of all your good deeds and a book of all your bad deeds. He puts the good deeds on a scale, the bad deeds on the other side. If the good deeds go down, you go up. But if the bad deeds go down, so do you, and you will burn in hell forever and ever. I was nine years old when I heard that. My mom had already convinced me that I was an evil boy, and I knew my bad deeds would never outweigh my good deeds. And so I was consigned from the time I was nine to believing that I would end up in hell. So it's just better not to think about God. It's better not to think about heaven. And my dad was my hero. And when he killed himself, it was just better really not to think about heaven or hell, to think about, about my dad burning in those uh, caverns. And did you know that all over the world, the majority of people, doesn't matter what religion they're in, the majority of people believe some version of St. Peter's scales, that we go to heaven because we deserve it, because we're good. 
And uh, that just simply can't be true. No one will ever, ever deserve to go to heaven. But I didn't know that. I, uh, I didn't, we had, we had, my friend, parents not only had no Christian friends, they had no friends. And uh, I was in a group of about seven boys and we were all athletes and we all had uh, this in common. Our parents were either divorced, getting divorced, alcoholic or becoming alcoholic. So there was no supervision on us. And uh, I could not distinguish myself athletically or academically. I never saw the purpose for school. So my transcript was riddled, riddled with D's and F's. Um, I flunked geometry when I was a sophomore. And then I followed that up by flunking typing. <laughs> How do you flunk typing, right? <laughs> Well, it was a nine o'clock class and I was still in recovery mode at nine o'clock. So I just couldn't get to school that early. I ended up flunking typing. So, so I got a transcript that won't allow me to go to college. Plus we got no money for college. Uh, I got no male model of a man I want to be like. Uh, and I've got these seven friends. We're all out of control. And I try to distinguish myself by being the most reckless kid in high school. What chance would you give a kid like that for a meaningful life? I mean, what chance would you give a kid like that to make it to 21. I mean, I would drive drunk 120 miles an hour just to impress my friends. What chance would you give a kid like that? I had uh, one friend who became a Christian. Uh, accidentally, he was chasing a blonde named Dixie to church camp. And uh, <laughs> yeah, only in Texas, a blonde named Dixie at a church camp, right? <laughs> and, he, and he didn't catch Dixie. Uh, he caught religion. The worst kind of religion, Southern Baptist, hellfire, damnation religion. He came back from that church camp telling us we weren't supposed to get drunk anymore, uh, that we were supposed to respect girls. And we said, Bruce, we'll see you. And we excommunicated him from our group. And, and Bruce uh, prayed for me faithfully every day for 18 months. I wouldn't have anything to do with him. He, tr he tried to witness to me uh, a couple times. Uh, and, and I just sent him away from my house, wouldn't have anything to do with him. And 18 months later, after he comes to the Lord, on December 18th, 1965, he cons me into spending the night at his house with the promise of introducing me to two new, beautiful girls from another high school in Fort Worth. He forgot to tell me that he had met them at a church function and they wanted to be missionaries. <laughs> so... So he, he left that part of the story out. So I, I, I go to his house. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm on this side in a bed about to go to sleep. He's on that side of the room. And I don't know why I ask him this, but I say, Bruce, how do you think a person gets to heaven? And here's what he said. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. I had never heard Jesus Christ died for me. And you say, how do you live in the Bible belt and not get that message at 17. Well, this was 1965, right? There were no bumper stickers in 1975 saying Jesus died for you. Uh, no religious TV. Um, the only way you could get that message was go to church, and I didn't go to church. Or you have a Christian friend, and my, my parents had no Christian friends. I had no Christian friends until Bruce, and then I wouldn't talk to Bruce. So I did not even know who Jesus Christ was until I was 16, and in the the spring of that year saw the greatest story ever told. And, and I saw Jesus die on a cross, and I go, dang, he was such a nice guy. Why'd they have to go and do that? I, I didn't know it had any relevance to me at all. And, and the resurrection, I don't even remember that part of the story. Um, so this is the first time on December 18th, 1965, 2 a.m. in the morning, I hear Jesus Christ died for me. And then Bruce said, if you will trust him to forgive you, and give you a new life, he will come into your heart and never leave. I said, what if I do something really bad afterwards? And he started laughing. And he said, Jackie, I can guarantee you're going to do bad things the rest of your life. But God doesn't come into your life because you're good or bad. He comes into your life because you trust him, trust him to forgive you and give you a new life. And uh, so he said, it's so important what he said. Trust him to forgive you and give you a new life. It, it's, it's not really trusting him if we just say, oh, Jesus, I want your forgiveness. I just trust you to forgive me. But if you don't mind, I'll just take it from here on out. I'm, I'm pretty capable of managing my life. See, that's not really trusting him. That's wanting some kind of fire insurance policy for nothing. Uh, to, to really trust him, to believe in him, is to trust him for the forgiveness 
and then to trust him for his version of life. Because my version of life wasn't working out. And he said, then he'll come into your life and he'll never leave. And when you're 17 years old and you and everybody you've ever loved has left you to hear the greatest person in the universe would never leave you, that's too good to be true. And I, I just said, that can't be true, Bruce. And he goes, oh, yeah, it's true. You're just real calm. Oh, yeah, it's true. I said, how do you know it's true? He said, because Jesus said so and Jesus can't lie. And then he quoted the first verse of Scripture I ever heard, John 10, 28, where Jesus said, I give my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. The instant I heard that verse, I was born again. I couldn't have told you I was born again. because I, hadn't, I didn't have that in my vocabulary. Salvation, repentance, confession. I never went to church. I, none of those words were in my vocabulary. I never heard born again. All I said in my heart when I heard that promise of Jesus, all I said was, God, I'm coming over to your side. And I didn't tell, I, I believed, but I couldn't even say I believed because I just, I, it's, I just didn't have the Christian words. And uh, about three days later, I call Bruce and I say, Bruce, I don't know what you guys call this, but uh, I want to come over to God's side now. And he goes, Jackie, don't go anyplace. I'll be right there. It's like, <laughs> he's not going to give me a chance to change my mind. <laughs> he, he hustles over to my house and he takes his, his King James Bible, read red leather, red letter edition, sticks it under my nose and, and says, this is John 3. This is what Jesus says has happened to you. You've been born again and you're like a little spiritual baby. And now you've got your whole life to grow up into a spiritual adult. And if you will pray and if you will read scripture and follow Jesus, you will grow up and become a spiritual adult. And, and then he took me through the Sermon on the Mount. And when he left my house, he, he, he said, he left his Bible and he says, here, read this. And, and you know, back in the day, kids complained uh, that they couldn't understand that Elizabethan English. Uh, not me. It just, it was beautiful to me. It seemed, made, made God and the Bible seem holy. And, uh, and when I started reading the Sermon on the Mount by myself, I just thought, man, I've never read anything like this. It's so counterintuitive. It, it's got to be true. I read um, Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I didn't have to steal my clothes anymore. You know, I, all I got to do is follow him. He's going to pro provide that. I mean, this is incredible. I've got, I got in on a great deal. And I started reading the Bible, and I just never stopped. Um, I, God sent a young life leader to disciple me, become my spiritual father, my best friend, my big brother. He taught me to uh, study scripture. He taught me to read Christian books, C.S. Lewis. He taught me how to memorize scripture. I became a young life leader like him, and, and I was enjoying the Christian life. And, uh, and then I met some guys from seminary who knew the Bible so well. I ended up uh, going to seminary, majoring in Greek and Hebrew. I found out I had this gift for Greek and Hebrew. It wasn't that uh, I was just good at it. It was I absolutely loved it. I mean, participles and infinitives made me happy. Uh, you know, just <laughs> figuring all the, out all the options you had now once you learned uh, that there were 20 different meanings for of and, and, and so on. And, so, and I just excelled at Greek and Hebrew. At 17, I didn't know a single verse of Scripture. At 27, I became a professor of Old Testament exegesis and Semitic languages at Dallas Seminary, one of the great evangelical seminaries in our country from, in 10 years. Uh, all because uh, my former best friend prayed every day for me for 18 months to come to know the Lord and then told me the gospel. Those gifts were in me. I've been given those gifts at birth. But my home life and, uh, and, uh, and, and the way my life un unraveled, those gifts would have just lain dormant had somebody not loved me and prayed for me. And uh, there are people out there that we love, that if we'll just pray for them, we'll have the opportunity to tell them uh, the gospel. And the gospel, it's so important to know the gospel is really simple. Jesus died on the cross for us. If we trust him to forgive us, give us a new life, he will come into our heart and never leave again. It's not about turning over a new leaf and deciding to be good. Uh, it's not about being given a chance to go to heaven. It's being given eternal life right now, the moment we trust him to forgive us, 
and give us a new life. And um, so I, I, would, I would just love to say that from the time I became a pre- professor on, life really went well for me. Uh, actually, the, probably the worst thing that happened to my spiritual life was becoming a professor at an early age uh, and feeling so proud and so superior it, uh, and, and feeling like the most important thing in life was just uh, knowing uh, Scripture. I went through a period where uh, there was a hardness in my heart. I felt like the most important thing was studying the Bible. It was more important than praying and knowing doctrine and that sort of thing. And if you asked me about loving God during those days, I would have told you that uh, loving God meant obeying God. And really loving God just meant studying Scripture. Uh, because, you know, you, if you study Scripture, you're spending time with God. You spend time with people you love. Therefore, studying the Bible is the way we express our love to God. And, and, uh, and my heart was becoming hardened. And uh, I bumped into some guy. Oh, and, and the other thing is, I didn't believe that God healed anymore. All that supernatural stuff on the Bible, my seminary said it's not happening anymore. So, so, so what is happening? Study the Bible. Uh, I mean, you can pray for people if you want, but probably nothing's going to happen. I mean, for healing and that sort of thing. And uh, then I met some people who challenged me and, uh, I, uh, and got me to pray for the sick. And Lisa and I started praying for the sick. And we started seeing God heal, things like aneurysm, documented on angiogram. I've been in the room when blind eyes have been opened, when people have gotten out of wheelchairs and, and walked. But the, the best thing about encountering the supernatural uh, was coming back into contact with the fact that God really, really wanted me to feel his affection and wanted me to love him. And I want to just share um, th- uh, three prayers uh, that will help us that have helped me and my uh, friendship with God. Um, All over the world today, uh, people are gathering. And in in many cases, people like me are standing on a stage and we're giving people something to do instead of a person to enjoy. Okay, it's a huge, huge difference between serving someone we have to and serving someone we enjoy. The key to life is feeling the affection of Jesus and enjoying him, feeling his pleasure in us. And I spent 20 years in an academic community and never knew that. I spent 20 years in a theological academic community and never once prayed that God would let me feel his affection. So uh, I bumped into some guys who uh, felt loved by God and who were passionate about God. And, uh, and I, I learned some things for them, and I want to share three prayers with you this morning that helped me the, get on the road to actually becoming a friend of God. What's a friend of God? Someone who enjoys God. We've all had best friends, right? Why do we have that best friend? So we could serve that best friend? No, that best friendship was never about service. It was about the pleasure we feel when we're with our best friend. That's why we have that friendship, right? We have a special chemistry with that best friend that we don't share with anyone else. It doesn't mean anyone else is bad or inferior to our best friend. It just means there's something between us, our chemistry, um, that I don't share with anyone else. I feel this pleasure when I'm with my best friend. And if my best friend needs me to do something for them, I'll do it in a heartbeat. But it's not about serving, right? We've all had friendships like that. And, And Jesus... That, that's what Jesus wants with us. He wants us to have that kind of uh, friendship. Uh, I, I said three prayers. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'm going to share two. This is, um, we're running out of time. This is John 15, 15. If you brought your Bible, turn to John 15, 15. John 15, 15. There are four Gospels, Right? And this is the only gospel with this verse in it, where uh, Jesus looks at the 12. This is the night before he goes to the cross. Um, and he says this to them, John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus, is, is he's not saying you're not servants anymore. He's saying, there's something more important than service. You're still going to serve me, but there's something more important than that. I want you to be my friends. I want you to enjoy me. I want you to feel my pleasure in you. Uh, That's what friends do. And and I want you to serve me out of that pleasure, not because you have to. 
And, and John is the only one who, who caught this. I mean, he said this to all of them, right? But it only appears in his gospel. You know why? Because John was the best friend of Jesus. Have you ever heard that before? But when, when John wants to describe himself, how does he describe himself? The, he never says, this is John writing the gospel. Five times he says, this is the uh, disciple whom Jesus loved. John had some special relationship with uh, the Jesus that was different than the others. He had this kind of, they, they were all friends, they all loved him, but John was his best friend. And you, you see this in a, in a number of ways. Um, you see it at the, uh, the, the Last Supper. They're all gathered around the table, and Jesus, in, in, in the next chapter, uh, drops the bombshell on them, right? Uh, he says, one of you is going to betray me. And they all go, uh, who, they're, they're wondering, who is it? But nobody has the guts to ask him, right? You know the story? All right. So uh, not even Peter will ask him. And Peter will pretty much say anything, anytime. You know, he's, he's famous for popping off and then, and then gets corrected by the Lord. Uh, but this night around that table, he won't say a word. He looks over at John and he hits him. He goes, John, you ask him. Because Peter knew what everybody else around that table knew. John could get something out of Jesus that no one else could, and he wasn't afraid to do it. Right? So where was uh, John sitting at the Last Supper? You remember? He's sitting right next to Jesus. Sit, sitting next to his best friend. That's, that's what best friends do. They sit together, right? They usually wind up sitting together. Same table. So J John just goes, okay, Peter. And he leans his head back on Jesus' chest. And he goes, who is it, Lord? Who's going to betray you? And uh, Jesus says, it's the one I give this piece of bread to. And he hands the bread to Judas. John straightens up and he goes, uh, Peter, Peter. It's uh, uh, Judas. He's, he's the one. No big deal, right? He's your best friend. You can ask your best friend anything. I was saying this one time, and a kind of quasi-theologian type person got really mad at me. So he said, you mean to tell me you think Jesus loved John more than he loved the other apostles? I go, no, I don't believe that for a second. Well, you just said he was his best friend. I go, yeah, I believe that with all my heart. But being a best friend is about more than love. Being a best friend is also about trust. And Jesus trusted John in a way he couldn't trust the others. And you see that the next day. Because where are the others the next day? They're gone. And so there's Jesus hanging on the cross in, in the most painful moment of his life, being separated from the Father spiritually, separated from the Holy Spirit, and he looks down and he sees his mom. There are four women standing at the foot of the cross. And he sees the anguish on his mom's face. His mom is trying to figure out how to put what she's looking at together with those words of Gabriel, that, that promise about her son being the, uh, the, the Messiah. She's trying to figure out, what is he doing up there? Why is he like this? It's four women at the cross. One man. John. Jesus looks down at his mother. He sees the agony on her, and he thinks, not my brothers. They, uh, they don't even believe in me. Not the others. They've all left me. John, you're the only one I have. And he looks down at John, and he says, behold your mother. And he looks at his mom and says, behold your son. <coughs> Jesus trusts John with the most precious person on earth he has, his mother. Wow. See, he really was his best friend. And John is the one who recorded Jesus saying, I no longer call you servants. I don't want that to be your main identity. I want your main identity to be, you are my friend. And so I, when I discovered that, I started praying, Lord, I want to be one of your friends. Everything, every good thing we have begins in prayer. It begins with a request for uh, grace. Every good thing I ask for, I'm asking for something I don't deserve. Somebody says, well, you're just asking for that because you, you know your life will be better. Yeah, that's true. That's one reason. So what? I never said I was pure. I, I'm praying this prayer to become pure. I'm praying this prayer so that I love a person like the Father in heaven loves him. If I already had that, I wouldn't have to be praying. So I just say, Lord, I want to be one of your best friends. Uh, and 
I mean, not just a friend. I want to be one of your best friends. I want to be like John. And, and you go, really? Yeah. Why not ask for the biggest thing? I mean, his heart is so huge, he can accommodate many, many best friends. I mean, there's a Mary. Mary is one of his best friends. He, he looks at her. The others are ticked off at her. And he looks at her and he says, Todd, leave her alone. She chose the best part of the banquet. She chose me. She chose friendship with me. You think I'm going to kick her out of the room? Think I'm going to tell her to be quiet because she, you don't care for what she's doing right now? Why not just make that the prayer of our life? Lord, let me be one of your best friends. I pray it every day. And, uh, and when I first started praying it, nothing happened. I don't know how long I prayed it before I started noticing a softening in my heart, noticing a tenderness toward uh, Jesus. And then I began to feel him uh, sometimes express his affection for me. And that's something I pray for every single day now. Lord, let me feel your affection today. Um, I was a young life leader for years. And I can't tell you how many times I'm standing uh, opposite a boy and we're talking about his life, about his family. And the boy, the high school boy says, uh, yeah, I know my dad loves me. And he's looking down at the ground. His voice drops an octave. And I'm thinking, if that's really true, why are you so sad when you say that sentence? So I travel all over the church, all over the world today. And I see the same thing in the church. Yeah, I know God really loves me. Really? Why are you so sad when you say that sentence? There's a huge difference between knowing a theological fact and experiencing the affection of someone. And what God wants, I mean, and I've heard preachers say, you just got to preach it to yourself. You just got to tell yourself that uh, God loves you. Really? Is that the way God, is that the way love works? You just tell yourself somebody loves you? How, how do you like that, wives? You just tell yourself your husband loved you. He told you that 20 years ago when you got married. Now just tell yourself that's still in force till he rejects it. Really? Is that the way love works? Or do lovers not have some kind of responsibility to help people feel affection? And there are apostolic prayers in the New Testament that, that the apostle prays to feel the affection of Jesus. When I started praying, Lord, I want to be one of your best friends, it just started sneaking up on me and I started feeling his affection in different kinds of ways. He's so creative. And the way he can say, I love you. So creative, so many different ways. Uh, and and he'll, there's hardly a week that goes by now that I don't feel the affection of Jesus. So, but at one time, I didn't feel much affection from Jesus. I was working real hard to earn it. And now I don't, I don't work to earn it anymore. I'm, I'm in a different uh, place now. And it started with just a real simple prayer. Lord, let me be one of your best friends. Lord, let me feel your affection today. And then the last prayer. Uh, uh, that I want to mention. It's a phenomenal prayer. It's in Psalm 27. If you brought your Bibles, turn to Psalm 27, verse 4. Psalm 27, verse 4. Psalm 27, verse 4. Um, Jesus was the greatest prayer that ever lived. Among the saints who's the greatest prayer that ever lived. We're, we're turning to one of his psalms right now. It's David. The psalms are prayers, right? That, uh, that are uh, many of which can be uh, sung. Uh, he wrote these 3,000 years ago, right? That's true. And two billion people are still praying them and singing them today. Who has that track record? Okay, so what kind of literature 3,000 years ago are we praying and singing today? Is anybody praying and singing today? It's right here. He, he, the most poetic, he's a friend of God, man after God's own heart. He, he wrote the great prayers that we're still praying and singing today. And then we come to this psalm, Psalm 27, verse 4. And he starts out and he says, One thing. So he's telling us that of all these prayers I prayed, I'm boiling them all down to one thing. If I get this one thing, then I get everything else I've asked for. So what is this one thing? One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord. He said, if I can just see the beauty of the Lord, it will have a transforming effect on me. Later, John will say in, in 1 John chapter 3, he says, right now, 
uh, we, we don't, we're not, what we really are doesn't appear. But one day in the next life, when we have our new body, our new eyes, we're going to see him. And when we see him, we'll be like him. David got that message early. If I can see the beauty of the Lord, just the vision of that beauty is going to have a transforming effect on me. So, but the only way we can see it is through supernatural revelation. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen by natural eyes. It's going to be through supernatural revelation. So, I encountered this a few years ago, and uh, I decided to devote one whole Saturday to uh, figuring out what the beauty of the Lord is and what it meant to see the beauty of the Lord. Be because I'm really a spiritual person, you know? I can, I'm not like you. I can devote a whole day to one verse of Scripture, just meditating on it, praying. It, I also wanted to stand on a stage the next day like I'm doing today and talk about it. So, And I, and I hate standing on a stage and uh, empty-handed and boring people. So uh, my motives were a little mixed. But you know what I've learned about my motives? They're always mixed. I've never done a good thing that I couldn't figure out the advantage that good thing was going to bring to me. All my motives are always mixed. And it used to trouble me. It doesn't trouble me any longer. I just accept that as long as I'm in this broken life, this broken body, uh, my motives are going to be mixed. And it doesn't bother him at all. You know, the only kind of people he, he has, the only kind of people he shows his affection to are people with mixed motives. Just, just people like you and me, weak and consistent people. Uh, those motives are going to be purified one day when I stand before him and see him like he really is. So I, I really want to understand uh, what his beauty is and, uh, and, and what it means to see it, experience it. And, uh, and I'm going to spend a whole day praying about it, but my motives are mixed too because I want to share it with, with my my, my spiritual uh, family. So I'm working that day, and uh, theologians and, and apostles, they've, uh, you know, they've quibbled over beauty for uh, years. And I'm reading through books and uh, uh, commentaries, and, and I'm doing this for like two or three hours, and it's apparent after two or three hours that he has not hidden his beauty in books that day. And so I don't feel anything. I mean, I know I read, I read Aquinas. The most famous definition of beauty among the theologians is probably Aquinas in the 1200s. He says, beauty is what gives us pleasure when seen. Okay, all right. But that's kind of tame. And so I rummaged around through some of his disciples, Aquinas' disciples, and I came up with this. Beauty is what is a mysterious harmony that dazzles us when we experience it. And uh, so now the next step is I go, Lord, I want you to dazzle me with your beauty today. Not a theological truth. I want an experience of your beauty. I want you to dazzle me with your beauty. And I really did want him to do that, but also wanted a good story to tell the next day, right? Mixed motives. Uh, so I could, wasn't getting it out of the books, so I uh, crossed the hall from my study. I go over and I lie down on our guest bedroom bed, and I say, uh, Lord, I am not getting up till you dazzle me with your beauty. See, I, I, I know a little bit about dazzling. I mean, I was saw a sunset for the first time when I was 18 over the Pacific Ocean and watched it drop into the ocean and watched God paint the skies orange and purple. And, and I, was, uh, I was dazzled. I heard Beethoven's uh, Ninth for the first time when I was 23. I was dazzled. And I saw this beautiful girl get out of the back of a yellow Pontiac Le Mans in, uh, in May 18th, 1974. And I was totally dazzled and never recovered from that. We ended up getting married a year later. So I know what it's like to be dazzled. Now I want God to do that to me. Uh, so uh, I say, I'm going to lie down on my guest bed, and I'm not getting up to you dazzle me. I'm just going to let my mind free associate here. So I'm lying on the bed, and I'm thinking about go back to college and uh, first church, and, this, and I'm just kind of rummaging around, and here's some acts of love and forgiveness and kindness. But after two hours, I was not dazzled. Um, so I sit up on the bed, and I say, please, God, you can do better than this. <laughs> and, and I really do talk to him like that. I mean, just, just I tell him what's on my heart. What I, I'm not disrespectful, but I just go, 
you could do better than this. And, uh, and then as soon as I say, you can do better than this, my uh, smartphone pings. And I take it out and I look at it, uh, and it's a video. It's 18 seconds. I put my phone back up and I walk across the hall. I get back, I turn my computer on, and I watch the video. And I start laughing. And then I hit play again. And then I hit play again. And I keep hitting play and delighting in that uh, video. I can't, uh, I can't stop watching the video. And I think, you know what? God's waiting for you back in the back bedroom. You, you need to get over to that bedroom now. And I go, okay, just one more time. And, and I punch it one more time. And I just forgot God and couldn't stop watching the video. The video was a, a picture of uh, my granddaughter, Rachel. She's two months old. She's lying on her back. And her mother and her mother's mother uh, are telling her to say goo, and I can't stop watching it. It's 18 seconds. Let me show you what I saw that day. So we can get that on. Yeah, there you go. A goo. A goo. You were made for the camera. Like, I like it. good talking. I like to talk. Well, look at Your you. Your bow looks pretty, Rachel. A goo goo. Like a goo. Did, did you hear that at the end? Oh, some of you didn't hear it. Let's just do it one more time. Just do it just 18 seconds. Listen at the end. Listen to the You were made for the camera. I like it. Good talking. I like to talk. Well, look at Your you. Your bow looks pretty, Rachel. A goo goo. Like a goo. That? Two months old, and she says her first syllable on command. I mean, how brilliant is that? Right? So I'm sitting there watching that. I can't get out of the chair, and uh, I start laughing at myself for delighting in that little baby girl so much. I mean, 18 seconds of her life have just made my spirit dance on the stars. And then, I, and then I think, uh, I'm staring at beauty right now. Eleven months ago, that little baby was just a single cell. Before she was a cell, before there were any cells, before there was a when or a then, she existed in the mind of eternal beauty. And here she is speaking her first syllable after traversing epochs and having her days written in the book of life. It's only one moment among millions that will make up her existence. And yet I want to remain in this moment for as long as possible. I am being dazzled by beauty. Then I feel a pang of sadness. She is growing up so fast and I'm going to miss so much of her life. If we stay in separate cities, I want to jump on a plane and go to her. I keep watching and watching and I laugh at myself for delighting in that little baby girl. Then I hear God say, that's how I feel about you. And I sob and I sob. I reach uh, for the computer and I sob and I sob. I, I just heave. And, and finally, when I can say anything, it's minutes and minutes before I can say anything. I just say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Never, I, I would say God loves me and I would say I've had experiences of his, his love. But I would never in my wildest dreams say God delights in me like I delight in that little baby, Rachel. He had to come down in her room and speak that to my uh, spirit. And now, uh, it, here's something that's really important for you to understand. I am not a holy person. Not at all. I have so many inconsistencies. I have so many wrong things uh, in, in my life. And the closer I get to God, the more of the garbage I see in my life. But that garbage doesn't prevent him from delighting in me, from uh, like I delight in that little two-month-old granddaughter. And I would never, ever have known that had he not said it to me. And I go back to this experience over and over. But since then, he's found all sorts of creative ways to, to repeat this experience. This is not something, for, I'm, I'm not a holy person. This is not something for holy people. This is something for God's people. This is something he wants to do for all of us. He wants to do the same thing for you, and it, and it probably won't involve a two-month-old granddaughter. It'll be some other way that he has of showing you that he is crazy about you, just like you are right now, without 
one more change, that He can delight in you like you are right now with all of the inconsistencies in our life. And you know how this began for me? Lord, I want to be one of your friends. Then it was, Lord, I want to be one of your best friends. And then it was, Lord, show me your beauty. Let me see your beauty today. That's a daily prayer. Lord, let me see your beauty today. And one of the ways that uh, he, he shows us his beauty is by letting us feel his affection for us. So why don't we stand and let's pray for that for all of us. If you came this morning and uh, you, you don't really know what would happen to you if you were to die right now, where, where you would go, uh, you, you haven't been certain about uh, your, where you stand with God. But this morning, while I was talking, and I was talking about trusting Him to forgive me and give me a new life, you could feel your heart beating a little faster and it started to make sense to you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and you could give your heart to Him this morning. And it's just a simple matter, just exactly what I did. Uh, Lord Jesus, I trust you to forgive me and give me a new life. Uh, if you feel that, if you want to give your heart to him, you could do that right now. And then before the day's over, just come down here to the front and, and let some of us pray with you. And, and we want to help you get started in this uh, friendship with him. So Father, uh, we pray for, for anyone here who doesn't who hasn't yet come to know you, but you're calling them now. Would you speak to them? Let them be born again in this very instant. And we pray, Lord, for, uh, uh, for all of us in this room, we pray, let us feel your affection, how much you like us, just like we are right now. Show us your beauty. Let us become uh, one of your friends in these last days on the earth, one of your very best friends. I pray for an impartation of the Holy Spirit, for us to love the Son of God, Father, like you love him, for us to be one of his friends, and for us to feel his affection in us. Grant, grant that impartation to us so that becomes our go-to prayer, our daily prayer every single day. Now, Lord, would you let your healing hand come uh, over us? You know, all the wrong things in our body and in our spirit, yeah, would you come among us now in your healing and revealing power?